Hello, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our webinar today on Technical Reference Manuals, or TRMs, for Energy Efficiency Evaluation, Measurement, and Verification. My name is Steve Schiller, and I'm a Senior Advisor with the Berkeley Lab and the facilitator for this webinar series. I'm also the principal author of the new TRM guide, which is the subject of today's webinar. Our webinar is scheduled for about 90 minutes, and after a bit of introduction, I will be discussing TRMs for the information in this new guide. And then we have three speakers that will talk about their experience uh, in their uh, states and, and entities with developing, updating, and using TRMs. All the uh, phone lines for the audience are muted. If you do have questions, please type them into the uh, Q&A text box, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, though, and the recordings and slides will be available at the Berkeley Lab webinar website listed on this and other slides of this presentation hopefully uh, as early as today or certainly tomorrow or the next day. I also want to mention that the funding for this webinar is from the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. LBL's coordinated series with input from uh, and collaboration, of course, with DOE as well as the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, and the National Association of State Energy Officials, uh, whom I want to thank for their ongoing support. I also want to thank our outreach sponsors, including the Sea Action Network, under which the TRM guide was published, and others uh, who have helped with promotion of our webinar series. So a little bit of introduction. Uh, the Berkeley Lab, which is hosting these webinars, is supported by the U.S. Department of Energy to conduct non-classified research. It's operated by the University of California. The lab also, with funding from the Department of Energy, provides technical assistance to states, primarily state energy offices and utility regulatory commissions. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next slide. I also want to mention we have a disclaimer here, of course. Now, on the technical assistance, uh, LBL provides independent and what we believe is unbiased technical assistance for state utility regulatory commissions and energy offices, as well as tribes and regional energy and regional entities in a wide range of areas such as energy efficiency and demand response, renewables, and various grid topics. Contact information is listed here. It's available via the websites listed. Uh, and for those of you who don't write too fast, uh, again, these slides will be available on our uh, LBL EM&V webinar website. And if you'd like, you can simply uh, Google or search on the web for LBL EM&V webinars. Uh, the uh, webinar series that we have, um, you know, uh, has a fair amount of, 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 excuse me, of webinars that have been done before. This is the eleventh one in our series here. Uh, unfortunately, though, it's the last one that we currently have funding for. So again, I want to thank our our funders and our supporters for their ongoing support uh, of these. Uh, for today's webinar, we'll be talking about tech re technical reference manuals, of course, and as I mentioned, the basis for much of this webinar comes from a new state and local energy efficiency action or Sea Action Network guide on TRMs. The guide can be found on the Sea Action website, uh, which you can get by uh, Googling simply Sea Action TRM Guide. Uh, a little bit of information about TRMs here, but since I'm going to be going over that with the webinar, uh, meet in a, in a second here, I'll just skip over this part of it. I also want to mention that we have uh, speakers in addition to myself. Again, I'm Steve Schiller, a senior advisor at the Berkeley Lab and the lead author of the TRM Guide, along with co-authors Tom Ekman, Greg Leventis, and Sean Murphy. Uh, we also have presenting uh, for us three people to prevent different, present different state experiences, Katie Rich of the PUC of Texas, David Brightwell of the Illinois Commerce Commission, and Annette Beidel of the California Technical Forum. So before we get going with the uh, uh, webinar it's, uh, itself, I thought we'd do a little bit of a poll here. Folks like to participate and show uh, what your uh, role and, and relationship with TRMs are. Uh, the uh, abbreviation here, a P-R-O-G, or PROG, I suppose, is for Program Administrator or a PA, trying to keep the number of words, and then REG is uh, brief for Regulator. So uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, participate in here and give us a sense of uh, who our audience is today 
and uh, what your roles and relationships are with uh, uh, TRMs. I'll give a few more uh, seconds here for people to participate. Make sure you're uh, all uh, awake and uh, listening in here. A few more seconds, a few more people participate. So why don't uh, we're up to uh, most of our audience here. Let's see if we can get a couple more in. And let's, uh, let's skip to the results here. So um, we have a lot of, uh, lot of uh, folks involved. I see this doesn't quite line up quite well, but quite a mix of folks, including a large number of folks who uh, aren't particularly involved, it seems like, with TRMs right now. So hopefully this webinar will be particularly valuable for you all as, as well as everyone else on this background on TRMs. So with that, uh, let's get going on technical reference manuals. I'm also going to be talking a bit about the deemed savings method as well, uh, provide an overview because that's a lot of what uh, is covered in these TRMs. To kick off my presentation, here's the cover of the TRM guide. Uh, that my presentation is based on. Again, it can be found at the C-Action website, which you can get by doing a web search for C-Action TRM guide. Uh, here is a summary of the contents of the guide itself. There are five main sections, starting with, of course, the summary. And then there are background materials, which provide context on TRMs, as well as efficiency measures and EM&V basics. The third section talks about current practices for existing TRMs and their content and structure and development options. The fourth section provides recommendations on TRMs and recommendations on the use of deemed savings uh, approaches and methods. And then there's a number of resource materials. The guide is intended to be a pretty comprehensive document for both new folks to this area, but also those experienced with TRMs. Thus, users of the guide with related experience can go directly to summaries of how existing TRMs address various topics and the specific recommendations. And the guide is also organized so those without uh, such experience can benefit from the chapters and dependencies on the basics of TRMs and EM&V and various types of efficiency. So we look at it as a pretty comprehensive document that you can read the whole thing or just pull out the sections that are most relevant uh, to your interest uh, and background. Uh, the things I'm going to cover on the webinar today is do a bit of an introduction to the evaluation impact evaluation, the impact methods we use on with a focus on Dean Savings methods, and then do a uh, discussion of TRMs, and then cover the recommendations at a pretty high level, which are in there, uh, which address both using and developing Dean Savings as well as the development and the use of uh, TRMs. So starting with a bit of introduction to uh, impact evaluation methods, there's three basic categories of methods used to determine the impacts of efficiency programs. Uh, these are described in a number of guides. Uh, for example, the C-Action Impact Evaluation Guide, which can also be found on the C-Action website. The first method uh, listed here is measurement verification, or M&V, probably the oldest method used as it involves site measurements, whether they be short-term measurements of power consumption, of a motor or whole building energy consumption from billing data, maybe just operating hours of the lights or some combination of that. And M&V also involves various analysis tools that use the collected data to estimate the baseline energy use and come up with the savings. A document called the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol defines four of those options. Uh, they're creatively called A, B, C, and D for measurement and verification. Next, we have deemed savings method, and this involves a stipulated savings value with perhaps some on-site verification of the implementation of the subject efficiency measure, but really no field measurements are involved with deemed savings. Uh, if there are field measurements, then we're talking about measurement and verification, and deemed savings is not measurement and verification. The third approach uh, involves the use of some form of comparison groups, often called experimental or quasi-experimental methods. With this method, the energy use of the participants or a treatment group are control, compared with a control group's energy use to determine the savings. Typically, what we have in TRMs is that they talk about deemed savings uh, and M&V uh, approaches and provide information relating to those. So I'm going to be focusing, though, on the deemed savings methods because that's what TRMs really are most known for. The primary metric 
is a deemed savings value. It's also known as stipulated savings values and unit uh, energy savings. Uh, these are the documented numerical values such as per unit energy or demand savings that define an agreed upon performance of a specific efficiency measure. For example, what the ki annual kilowatt hour savings would be for a LED lamp uh, implemented in a defined application. Uh, team values also can be developed for measured cost or net to gross ratios and other factors, uh, but these are less commonly found in TRMs. What we have, um, and I want to emphasize the word fully, is fully deemed savings values. And these are the result of the deemed savings method. In comparison with m and because there are some site measurements with perhaps other factors stipulated, one can have partially uh, deemed savings values. So we have fully deemed savings values, which is just the number. This is the number that's going to assign for, say, the energy savings. These are fully deemed. And then possibly with other approaches in M and V, you might have a partially deemed savings value. Uh, so across the U.S., efficiency programs rely on these TRMs as sources for these fully deemed stipulated savings values um, or uh, partially deemed and, and various deemed calculations and variables. Uh, and they use this for planning purposes, but also assessing the impacts. So what we have in these are the uh, both the deemed savings, but uh, also in addition to the deemed savings values, we can have deemed variables, which are values for parameters that determine the performance and efficiency measures. Uh, these might be, for example, weather data. Then there's factors. These are attributes of the efficiency measures that are dependent on the measure itself, such as the wattage of a light bulb. Uh, and then we have the deemed calculations. Uh, these are quite common, and these are the agreed to or stipulated simple to very complex equations used to calculate the energy or demand savings associated with efficiency measure. And these would be defined perhaps in a TRM, and they would use whether measurements or deemed variables or factors uh, to determine savings. So what we find in addition to deemed savings, again, is deemed variables, deemed factors, and deemed calculations. Uh, the deemed savings value, as I've mentioned, can overlap with M and V methods because of the use of some uh, of these variables and factors and calculations. Uh, again, these might be used for determining the fully deemed savings values, but the end result would be just a deemed savings value, the fully deemed value. Or for M and V, there might be the partially uh, deemed value. Uh, so as compared to comparison groups or M and V, when should you use deemed savings? Well, Fully deemed savings values should really only be used when you have information that's developed from data sources such as prior metering studies and analytical methods that are widely considered acceptable for the measure and its purpose. And when the fully deemed savings is used, it's applicable to a specific condition, such as uh, a particular type of project. So you don't want to use a residential a lighting value in a commercial operation, for example. Uh, so what we have is deemed savings method used for projects with well-known and documented savings values, and the tendency towards a, what I've written here, a, a central, strong central tendency in the distribution of savings, uh, which is kind of a fancy way of just saying there isn't much variation in the savings across most installations. So we tend to see these with appliances, such as washing machines or computer equipment, uh, and then lighting projects, for example, with well-understood operating benefits. Well, excuse me, operating hours, for example. So turning back to the TRMs, what we see in TRMs is they tend to provide, include information that is used both for the deemed savings method and the M&V method, uh, which is shown on the bottom row of this figure here uh, coming up with either fully deemed savings values resulting from the deemed savings method and various inputs hopefully specifying the TRM that can be used in the M&V approach. Um, so, this is the kind of information we have in here as it tries to show the type of content. We'll be talking a little bit more about this as we get into TRMs, which starts actually with this slide here. So TRM, so what is this, this term? It's, it's really um, a term of art. Uh, they essentially hold information that document how efficiency measures, impacts are calculated, and then the source of information, that critical documentation as to how this will be used. 
and the TRMs are used for, for evaluation, but also for planning and implementation. The contractors and others can use the data, as well as planners, to try to estimate what the impacts would be of various programs. Um, as mentioned uh, several times before, there's deemed savings values and factors and variables and calculations that are found in them. And the formats typically available is uh, either a document, let's say a Word document, or a spreadsheet or electronic database. Essentially, these TRMs serve as a common resource, a common reference, hopefully providing transparency and consistency to all those involved in the process, all the stakeholders. Um, some other things about uh, TRMs is that they um, are or should be living documents that need to be updated. Uh, these can be done uh, as impact analyses and procedures evolve and new data is collected about the performance of different types of measures that are included in the TRMs. Uh, to account for things like changes in codes and standards or new energy efficiency measures. You know, and, and it's important to have these updating. Um, I do also want to mention here that these TRMs are mostly associated with utility customer funded efficiency programs, but they are used for other purposes. Some contractors might have their own version of TRMs with their uh, estimates of uh, savings for typical values. Uh, as TRMs um, are typically used with utility programs um, or programs funded by utility customer funds, they tend to be initiated by state utility regulators and in some cases are actually approved uh, by these commissions. Who prepares these? Well, it's usually the consulting firms uh, with expertise in efficiency measures. Uh, and it's, I, by the way, I keep mentioning efficiency measures as a focus, as is the case for most TRMs, but there are TRMs, and they certainly can include uh, demand response or water conservation or other distributed energy generation project information. hear me on. Hi, I had to switch over to my other line here as my microphone apparently just died. Uh, hopefully folks can still hear me. Uh, hello? We hear you, Steve. Oh, good, good. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so we have a map of our United States here. Um, and so program administrators and state commissions are developing and adopting these TRMs at a pretty uh, rapid rate. Um, as of the date of the guide's publication this summer, there were 28 state or regional TRMs. Uh, and this compares to about 17 uh, that we found in 2012 and, and maybe only half a dozen at the beginning of uh, this century. Uh, in addition to the state or regional TRMs, some utilities have developed their own and maintained their own. So in the TRM guide, there's a, uh, quite a substantial uh, table that summarizes key information about these TRMs as well. So uh, TRM objectives and, and benefits, um, you know, on this slide I list some of the uh, objectives and benefits, and, and really the TRMs play an important role in streamlining and planning and reporting functions for program administrators, establishing regulatory compliance, uh, but not exclusively uh, for jurisdictions where we have energy efficiency resource standards, they can be very important for helping tracking compliance with that. Uh, they also facilitate the savings calculations, and standardize the reporting. And, and one of the real important things is providing greater transparency and predictability uh, for all those involved in the savings claim. Uh, in effect, TRMs really are a mechanism for uh, encapsulating, showing what has been cumulatively learned from assessing, assessing efficiency actions in these various activities and putting this into one document. Now there are some challenges, of course, and some barriers to development of TRMs, and I try to talk about some of those here. Um, you know, the, you know, a lot of them are very common to what we find in other things in terms of funding and, and support um, for them. And, and the way to deal with these uh, really is, you know, coming up with a good planning process and, and working collaboratively and, and trying to have this uh, stakeholder uh, buy into this process. Again, this is talked about a fair amount within the TRM guide. Um, and so let's take a little break here and uh, get uh, folks uh, back to their computers and see if they want to participate in this uh, survey here and, and see that, uh, which type of TRMs you're currently involved with before we start talking about the various options available for jurisdiction coverage. So if you can, uh, take a look at the poll here and, and let us know uh, the type of TRM you're using.
Again, we're getting uh, a lot of, most of our folks are responding. Thank you. Just give it a few more seconds here. Looks like uh, for my little preview screen here, I think we'll hit, uh, let's see, get a few real people still participating here. I think we'll, we'll skip to the results now. And it looks like, you know, on the order of half the folks in our audience are using a statewide TRM, which are probably the most common ones. Uh, and then um, there's, you know, about a third or 30 percent of you that are currently using a TRM, but hopefully you have interest in that. And again, this uh, webinar will be helpful for you on that. Um, as asked this question, the, the TRMs are, you know, can be applicable to just a utility service territory um, or um, one program administrator. That might be a case like the Energy Trust of Oregon, or it might be for several uh, utility service territories within a state uh, that would typically be under the jurisdiction of one regulator, such as the Michigan TRM or the Arkansas TRM. Or in, in some places we have regional or multiple state uh, agencies, utilities, and program administrators have agreed to coordinate efforts. Uh, there's one in the Northwest as well as in the Mid-Atlantic. So these regional statewide efforts share some advantages of other types of, of you know, mutual coordination, uh, you know, basically reducing transaction costs through economies of scale, and actually the ability to bring some additional resources and creating potentially higher quality products and, and support and providing some consistency in terminology, consistency in reporting and formatting across, uh, say, a state or a region. Uh, and these can be particularly helpful. Uh, of course, again, there's some disadvantages to, you know, if you have too many folks involved in coordination, you know, such as, you know, perhaps coming up with the lowest common denominator product. And again, these types of issues and uh, is uh, ways to address them are addressed in the TRM guide. The content, I'm going to flip over this one pretty quickly here. We've talked about this, uh, or I've mentioned this a couple times here. Again, this is covered in the, uh, in the guide. The Structure and options, here's a uh, somewhat hard to read, uh, I must say small type uh, outline of a typical TRM guide. We have a couple of different uh, outlines within the TRM guide. This one shows that the meat of the content is in, uh, I'm going to use my little dots here, a little green arrows, is in the residential and commercial or non-residential measure categories. And this is where there would be lists, and then for each one of these there would be um, you know, detailed information about, um, you know, the, the, what the measures are, what their applications are, deep savings values, factors, calculations specific to those. The formats, I think I might have mentioned this before as well, that uh, they tend to be uh, PDF documents or Word documents. Uh, but there's also downloadable uh, spreadsheets that have been used. And in some places, there's actually uh, very nice uh, online web portals. There's a couple of examples listed here on this slide. Again, in the uh, TRM guide, there's a description of these various uh, ones, uh, the different states, and what their formats are. For the development and updating uh, process and options, uh, in the TRM guide, there's a whole chapter on developing and updating TRMs. Uh, some points made on development in the guide are that many jurisdictions start um, with other jurisdictions' TRMs, such as another state's TRM, and then modify them for their use. There's some pros and cons to this, and we can perhaps discuss this during the Q&A if people are interested. Um, other uh, issues are around the inclusion of stakeholders, and you hear about that when we get to the recommendations. Um, and on updating, of course, you know, it's important to maintain these as current uh, with current information. And again, the guide talks about uh, various steps for doing that. So let's turn to the recommendations uh, for the last uh, uh, several minutes of my presentation before we get to um, our uh, other uh, speakers talk about their experiences. In the TRM guide, there's nine recommendations that are discussed about the development and use of deemed savings values uh, in the deemed savings method. And then there's 10 recommendations uh, for the technical rent reference manuals, the TRM content uh, themselves. So uh, on the next several slides, I summarize each of these recommendations. I'm not going to go through each one, uh, but on each slide I'm going to try to highlight, say, one or two of them. On this one, I want to highlight the, the second one, which is a recommendation that deemed savings values should be applied 
the efficiency measures that are very well understood with documented experience it indicates, again, that there's that so strong central tendency in the distribution of savings, again, that fancy way of saying there isn't much variation, um, and that the measures uh, can be developed and documented with reliable data sources and reliable analytical methods um, for just really well-defined um, applications. So I'll list a few other things here as well, but just the importance of really using DEEM savings where they're appropriate, and that's when you understand uh, very well what's happening with the, with the measures and can document that. Uh, in this uh, next uh, set of recommendations here, I want to emphasize um, on the fourth one here, um, and that's about you know, whether we're talking about optimistic or conservative estimates. Uh, this is rather self-explanatory, but there is, you know, I think, sort of a natural human inclination by some to say it's best to have conservative values uh, when estimating savings. And sometimes we have others, perhaps even contractors, who tend to consciously or subconsciously push for optimistic values. The best thing really to do is come up with realistic values. Um, this way, so the measures are not over or underutilized. If you had too conservative of values, you might be bypassing the use of a measure where it's perfectly applicable. And of course, if too optimistic, uh, might be applying them where they where they shouldn't be applied. They're perhaps not cost effective. So you don't want to bias one way or the other. You really want to come up with you know the most realistic values. Um, in this slide here, I uh, want to try to emphasize a bit on recommendation number seven, the documentation. I'm an engineer, uh, so you hear a lot about this from, from folks you know, like myself with kind of background, just the importance of really doing a good job of documenting uh, the information, and this should be included within the TRMs. Uh, next, turning to uh, the TRMs themselves, uh, the the focus for me on this slide here is recommendations two and three that's best to develop TRMs with stakeholder input in a collaborative process and that when they are TRMs, they're going to be used by investor-owned utilities that are, have a regulatory agency, it's best to uh, have those uh, be approved by them. Um, this, this recommendation is pretty consistent with the opinion of many of the experts that TRM collaboratives um, should have a defined membership to ensure regular and active participation, uh, which in turn supports the efficiency, uh, the efficacy of the collaborative itself. Um, when collaboratives do exist, uh, they can provide really an excellent peer review process of practice journal use and scientific research to help with the rigor and the data and, and the analysis of being done. Um, and we just you know, having this really helps with the buy-in because part of what we're trying to do with the TRMs is come up with something that folks can agree to, whether it's the contractors, the regulators, the administrators of these programs and the values, and having them included really helps with both developing, you know, realistic values, but also having the buy-in for the process. And in terms of regulatory uh, participation, um, you know, having that staff participation really uh, helps, um, particularly if there can be an approval, that ensures that, that all parties can count on the information, the TRM, and not necessarily have that second guess down the road in some regulatory proceeding. Uh, turning uh, to this slide here, um, this again is a somewhat uh, self-explanatory one, the one I've highlighted, the sixth recommendation. Uh, that TRM should strive to use data and tools that are best available in, in really using current information um, that, that, you know, is available and involved. Um, so let's move on to the last set of recommendations. And this one I want to highlight here is around uh, the idea of regional TRMs. These really can be beneficial because of the potential cost savings on a per state or per utility service territory basis associated with developing and, and the ongoing costs with maintaining a comprehensive high quality TRM. And as I mentioned earlier on, the TRMs in themselves do not eliminate the need for actually doing the analysis to come up with the values to do the work. And if this can be shared across the region, 
Obviously, in some situations, there's going to be uh, situations where different weather, climate, uh, different conditions can indicate uh, separate values, but there's a number of measures that can utilize the same values, and even for those that have some variation, uh, the different savings, say, associated with different climate zones can be included as part of the TRM. And so aggregating resources and taking into account the studies and expertise from broader groups um, across efficiency programs and regions can really can potentially lead to higher quality TRMs than the individual TRMs might be able to afford on their own. Uh, and also, I noticed we have a number of people on the, on the call who are not using TRMs currently. Uh, the regional TRMs can be particularly helpful for states just starting out with their TRM development. So with that, I want to turn to my concluding uh, comments here and just you know, reiterate you know, the belief that TRMs can be very cost-effective, reliable sources for really sharing the information uh, that you know, has been developed over many years and putting it into a comprehensive, well-documented guide. Uh, we're hoping that the, excuse me, well-documented TRM, and that the guide, the TRM guide that I've been talking about uh, with the recommendations uh, that are explained obviously in more detail than I've gone over quickly here, uh, you know, is available and there to provide a basic resource for the development, the maintenance, and the use of these TRMs. And we're hoping that by having these, you know, supports, you know, solid, reliable TRMs, but also, you know, the overall goal of promoting good efficiency actions that have reliable and known uh, impacts. And so, you know, working towards making uh, an effective implementation of efficiency, these TRMs can be part of that. So um, I want to thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. We're going to uh, turn it over next uh, to our uh, other speakers who are going to discuss their experiences. Uh, and um, so first up, I'm going to put up um, Katie Rich, uh, who is with the Texas Commission. Uh, Tex Katie has been with the Commission for over 10 years. Uh, she's served in her current role as director for the past five years, and she manages quite a wide portfolio of efficiency and load forecasting and fuels as well as emergency management. Uh, she serves as the contract administrator for the state's uh, statewide EMNV contract, and as background, she has a Master of Public Service in administration. So with that, Katie, I'll let you take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me on. I was uh, just looking through the list of folks that are on, and I noticed that a couple folks that participated in helping us craft the Texas TRM are on, but most of my Texas stakeholders are down the hall in a uh, meeting room near me talking about the updates to the TRM as we speak. So it's kind of appropriate to have the TRM discussion today. So I want to take it to just talking a little bit about some of the benefits that we've seen. It's hard to believe that we started our EMNV contract in 2013, and I believe that we've made great strides since that time. So some of the benefits are just having more transparency in the measure savings, because what we had before were you know, a list of dockets that had all of the deep savings petitions and there was sort of a non-public catalog of those deem savings but to have those all in place and to see that now you know there's more m and protocols being added to that and things are just really sort of taking shape as well as the update process that we have in place and then consistency in the savings calculations improved estimates and supporting new measures. So that, that's been a great thing for the state of Texas is utilities are more likely to want to do more measures now that we have the EMMV staff to review their proposed deemed savings or their proposed m and I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an idea of how it was, it was set up just so that you know it's not just deemed savings measures, but that there are the MNB protocols I mentioned, and then there's also some implementation guidance that the EMNB team puts together if there are questions about the deemed savings or the MNB, just again to be very transparent in the whole process.
And as Steve mentioned in his discussion, you know, one of the recommendations was about having a collaborative process, and that's certainly what we've put in place from the beginning. So the rules laid out that we should update annually, um, at least annually, but we are looking at things annually. Just like I mentioned, they're talking about the TRM updates and that process, you know, as, as we speak. So they've, they've come up with sort of the defined measures to focus on for the next update to the TRM. And then, so that's with what we call the EEIP. So that includes utilities, that includes other energy efficiency stakeholders, that includes staff. Obviously that includes the EMNV team itself. And, you know, we agree on that prioritization and part of that is coming out of that EEIP meeting this afternoon. And we've had a little bit of a change to how we review deemed savings measures now that we do have the benefit of having EMNV staff before we were uh, just reviewing those and you know getting the information that we could. But now that we have the technical resources and we have the staff to be able to review those before they even come to us as a petition has been a great help. Um, we have folks that can now dive a little deeper and ask some of the questions about how it would actually be implemented or if there would be some question about the savings coming out of that based on how they were proposing to um, collect that information. And then again, as I mentioned, now having uh, the chance to do some MNV protocols is, has been great. Just being able to get in some new technology, some, some data centers or looking at things for hospitals or just certain areas that they can now hone in on. And then once it's updated, once it's been reviewed, then it gets added into the TRM. So you saw that there was that separate section for those to be added and then if there's data collection and it gets to a point where it looks like these can roll into Dean Savings then, then great. So one of the things that was in the, in the guidance document was talking about an update process. And so as I'll, as I'll note at the end, you know, our EMNV team noted that that really kind of validated the update process that we have lined out here for how everything gets added to the, the TRM, which is approved by commission staff via the rule. And so really the last point I want to make is whenever I went back to my UMNV staff and said, you know, what are some of the benefits of, of the guidance? And they were, part of it was, we wish that we had had that in place when we were starting in 2013, but it certainly helped us along the way and will help us immensely in the, in the future. And again, it just kind of validates the, the process that we're using for prioritizing updates going forward. And with that, um, Steve, I'll let you decide how you wanted to do questions. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Katie, for going through that and, and covering what's happening. Um, there is one question that came in that, that might have been covered by your last slide about, you know, how long uh, did Texas have the MNB protocols in place before the TRM uh, were developed? Um, um, I mean, we had within the rule that we could have MNB, but I will tell you that for the most part, we were heavily relying on team savings. Yeah, and um, you know Texas. I, I know from my history has been you know doing you know utility customer funded programs since the 1990s at least, and mm -hmm. you know a lot of the evaluation you know methods and protocols were written down, but not necessarily centralized. And you know with these more recent efforts of you know, combine this into these uh, guidance and uh, TRM. Right. Good. Well, thank you. Um, for uh, I'm going to turn now to our uh, next presentation. 
And uh, I think, uh, David, were you able to join us on, uh, to see the slides, or should we move your slides for you? I'm here and I can see them. I don't believe I can move them myself. Okay. So um, I, think, uh, I think we'll be doing that for you. So let me introduce David Brightwell. Uh, he's an economist uh, with the Illinois Commerce Commission. Uh, and he's worked on the development and implementation of efficiency rated policies for more than nine years. And uh, he holds a PhD in economics uh, from uh, down the road at Texas A&M University from uh, Katy. But he is definitely uh, an Illinoisan and in Illinois. So uh, David, you want to take it forward and let us know um, how we should uh, move your slides. OK, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, if we can go to slide two, that'd be great. Okay, Illinois um, basically started electric energy efficiency programs in 2008 with a new statute. Um, off and on, there were programs prior to that, some in the 90s, but nothing consistently. There basically became required for the major electric utilities in the state in 2008. The plans to implement the programs that started in 2008 were filed with the commission in 2007. Um, from 2008 to 2011, a few of the gas utilities within the state decided to petition the commission for um, energy efficiency program approval as well. And in 2000, uh, in approximately 2009 or 2010, the um, General Assembly enacted legislation requiring that plans be filed in 2010 and uh, would go into implica implementation in 2011. And the 2010 plan docu dockets um, to approve the energy efficiency plans for both gas and electric utilities, several stakeholders mentioned that there were um, there was great variation in the savings for similar measures, and they advocated for a technical reference manual, which the commission approved. Um, at some point after the 2010, around 2011, the uh, um, contract was signed and the TRM was developed. Um, at a later point, um, it became clear that not only was there great variation in, in the savings for similar measures, that different methodologies were used for different evaluators across the state and that the net to gross methods um, could end up being, or the net to gross values could be greatly divergent from one utility to the next, and t net to gross values were included in our TM as TRM as well. Um, so that's basically how the TRM came to be, came to be in Illinois. And with that, uh, we don't have any legislation that requires it. It was done by commission order. It's less informal than what a rule would be or if the General Assembly had en enacted the use of a TRM, but in general, the commission um, has um, pretty good oversight of the TRM process because it approves the contracts for the TRM administrator and has the right to fire the to have the TRM administrator fired if the commission deems that it's necessary to do so because of a lack of objectivity or independence. Um, so. Um, and there's a, the, excuse me, the utilities in general pay for the administrator, but you know, although they have the, they pay for it, they aren't really controlling the administrator. It's a collaborative process. We go to the next slide. So, as others have said, within Illinois, the TRM applies to both natural gas and electric values. We use a combination of deemed savings. Um, Team estimating procedures, and we update it annually with the new values going into effect at the beginning of the next plan year. Go to the next one. We go to the next slide, please. All right, so there's various reasons that you'll see updates with the ERM. There might be new measures that are introduced. Um, you know, there's new um, evaluations that come that show that there need to be updates to existing measures based on new information or information that's more relevant to Illinois. That it could be that when the um, measures came out, that w there were 
several majors, some from the East Coast, some from the West Coast, and not much from the Midwest, and we kind of tried to guess what it would be, f uh, what the value should be for Illinois based upon what we were seeing from other states, and that as evaluations took place in Illinois, that the Illinois values were incorporated within the m and Other reasons for updates is that errors were noticed and were correct, we were just correcting errors to previous values or um, previous uh, previous set uh, algorithms. Um, it, so basically, it's a, we use a collaborative process in Illinois, similar to what Katie was describing for Texas, to where it's not just the uh, in, independent third party, that the utilities, environmental groups, consumer advocates, state commission staff, um, I'll provide input from things that we found about various values, various um, estimates of what the major value should be. So to communicate with that, once somebody says that they think that uh, something needs to be added or changed within the TRM, there's automated emails that go out to everybody that subscribes to an email list. Meetings will come up to discuss changes once there's a sufficient number of measures to, to um, discuss. It's done by consensus most of the time. Um, for the most part, the, when the parties get together, it's kind of an arduous process. It's not like everybody's just there for 10 minutes and says yes or no, but after discussing things, um, you can come up to somewhat near, um, you can come up with consensus. Sometimes you can come up with a um, uniform, uni unanimous decision on a, on a variable. In the case that there is nine consensus, um, it, let me back up a minute. So that when, when the TRM goes for approval to the commission or is submitted to the commission, there's basically two separate proceedings that take place. One is for consensus issues where the commission will say, okay, the parties agree with this and the commission has the right to um, go against the consensus and come up with its own determination, but usually it doesn't. And then there's a nine consensus um, docket that goes into place to determine what should happen when there was nine consensus of, um, reached by the various parties and the commission will make the final approval in that case. And as I said in the previous slide, at the beginning of the following plan year, the commission approves a new version of TRM that primarily goes into effect um, prospectively. Can we go to the next slide? Um, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself on this. That these, um, basically, the TRM values are almost always um, applied prospectively. We don't go backwards and make corrections. There are a few cases that if there was a mistake that was made and that the consensus opinion is that it should be applied backwards to correct that mistake, it's done, but otherwise um, everything is used to um, deem values and determine the values of savings uh, future looking. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So my opinion from using the TRM in Illinois, when, when this was first proposed, I was skeptical. I thought, great, just more administrative work and more padding of bills for consultants and uh, within the state and that we're not going to get anything out of it, but it has really helped in reducing the uncertainty of how savings are counted for various measures. It reduces the fights or it reduces the stress of the fights because it's not done with a great sense of urgency within a um, docket to determine whether any utility um, met its goals or not. And it reduces the surprises to utilities because they know ahead of time how savings are measured and that the evaluators aren't going to change the method and that they're not going to know about the result until two or three months after the year is done when they get the evaluations in. We can go to the next slide. Um, some of the cons are that the TRM is huge. It's Within Illinois, it's multiple volumes. And it's really hard to keep track of everything that's in there. I'm not sure that anybody knows everything that's in it. 
Um, and like I said, it gets updated every year. So you might recall something and it's a year or two out of date and you have to go back and uh, reference it again. Um, within the determination of what the values are, there, there is conflict. It's not just everybody gets together, you're there for 10 minutes and just check yes on every item. Um, we've had implement or we've had manufacturers of various technology that have tried to um, inflict their opinions on TRM values and have held up the process before that I would really recommend that if you're doing this that you come up with a way to get um, parties with a conflict of interest out of the determination. Um, and also there's imperfect and asymmetric information that people that implement the programs are going to have the best knowledge of, of how the measures are performing in the field. And to the extent that a lot of these people are have performance bonuses and, and everything in their contracts, you're, you're more likely to get um, reports of corrections needed when the correction is un when when the mistake is um, unfavorable to the contractor, but not the extent when the that the um, not not at the point when it, when the mistake that's within the TRM that's not detected by anybody else is favorable to the savings goals that this implementer may have. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, uh, one thing that Steve asked us to do was look at the recommendations that were provided and to provide comments on those. And I'll say that, in general, I think that the suggestions are good. That um, I think Illinois does most of these. I think part of it is because we ended up hiring a um, TRM administrator that was very experienced in doing these, um, but that and, and that we follow um, most, most of these recommendations, and they are very helpful. One of the recommendations that he had was that regional TRMs maybe provide an excellent opportunity. I looked at this because I, I'm not familiar with them. I kind of thought about it in the sense of oh, if you have transmission projects that go through multiple states, that it can be problematic to get every commission to sign off on a or approve a transmission project for the portion that goes through their state and was wondering if if perhaps similar kinds of problems occur would occur with TRMs. Um, so one of the advantages I think that might happen if you had a regional TRM is that um, within the staff of the Commerce Commission, there's three of us that work full-time on energy efficiency. We can draw occasionally from other departments if there's an issue that comes up to, that's necessary. But that overall TRMs are pretty um, pretty demanding on the time in order to develop them and, and to update them, and that you might reach oh, benefits of having complementarities and expertise across the various states. That, for example, we don't have any engineers that work on these full time in Illinois. If, say, for example, we were to develop a TRM for the Midwest region. It's possible that Iowa has some individuals that are more adept at the um, at the technical expertise, where Illinois has a lot more individuals that are adept at the policy um, aspects of the TRM. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so that that finishes my discussion. Um, um, if there's any questions, um, I guess. I could take those now if Steve feels that's appropriate. Yeah, so, well, thank you, David, uh, very much for going through that. And actually, there were a couple of questions that came in, uh, but you actually covered them later in your slides. I think one of the ones that came up was this you know, question around the regional TRMs and whether there's some in the Midwest. And, and you talked about you know, some of the you know, um, 
you know, issues that could arise from that. I, I think the only thing I you might want to add, in case you want to comment further on the regional, uh, it's up to you, is that the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance did do a report, you know, which is referenced in the uh, C Action TRM guide, about the various TRM efforts in the Midwest to sort of summarize the, the ones that exist or, or are being proposed, for example, um, in Kentucky. So um, I, I know there's some efforts to at least you know look at those, and there's there's probably some overlaps in values and borrowing between. But um, that was one of the specific ones that came in. I don't know if you want to add anything else, or, or um, you know I think you did cover things pretty well. Oh, thank you. I I don't think I'm qualified to discuss the the MIA report or the Kentucky values, Kentucky procedure. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Well, let's uh, let's turn to our um, our last uh, but not least presenter, of course, uh, mm -hmm. Annette Bidel, um, who has over 20 years' of experience providing legal, uh, regulatory procurement and management support to efficiency and renewable energy programs in California, the Midwest, um, and internationally. She currently facilitates the California Technical Forum and helps drive that group's uh, consensus decision on technical issues related uh, to things such as the TRM. Uh, and that, by the way, also covers the educational spectrum with a Juris Doctor degree as well as a Master's of Science and Bachelor's of Arts degree. So with that, uh, Annette, uh, please take it from here. Thank you, Steve. So um, I'm going to be talking about the California Technical um, reference manual, and unlike the other two presenters, this is a proposal. It's not actually a reality at this point in time, even though we're moving forward with certain elements of it. Um, so again, this is a proposal and not actually um, a product yet. Uh, the California Technical Forum was established in 2014 by a broad coalition of stakeholders. It's funded by the four California investor-owned utilities, um, as well as the two largest publicly-owned utilities in California, LADWP and SMUD. Um, and it has the support of a broad range of additional stakeholders, including the California Energy Commission, um, environmental groups, um, implementer trade associations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the CalTF itself uh, is a uh, collaborative of technical experts, and right now we have 32. Uh, they're selected through um, an uh, uh, independent um, RFQ process. Uh, they're volunteer. Uh, we meet weekly, uh, sorry, monthly. Um, and the, the primary function of this group of engineers is to provide independent peer review of technical information associated with California's um, demand side management portfolio, um, and primarily up until now has focused on reviewing deemed values in California. Um, and through the, the initial work of the CalTF, um, the CalTF developed a proposal for creating a statewide repository of deemed values. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and and the, the title of that is the uh, California Electronic Technical Reference Manual. Uh, so currently there are multiple sources of deemed values in California. So there is DEER, which is a repository created by the CPUC uh, that hosts high impact measures. Uh, and it's about 50% of the measures that are currently being used in California. Um, deemed um, values are also characterized in utility developed work papers um, that are, are utility specific. And then there is a POU technical reference manual. Um, so the result of this is that there are multiple deemed values, measure, characteriz measure characterizations, and parameters for the same measure in California with very little standardization. Um, the documentation is difficult to identify. So there's a lot of documentation for DEER, but the actual values themselves are not linked to the specific documentation. So it's hard to find what the support is. It's hard to reverse engineer um, and, and you know, recreate the values that are in DEER. So um, that's been a challenge, particularly in developing new measures to understand um, what previous similar measures were um, based on. And um, implementers um, have been excluded from the process. So up until the 
California T uh, Technical Forum, um, the, the whole new uh, measure development and updating process was really just utilities and then CPUC staff. <clears throat> so the, the elements of this project are, number one, measure consolidation and standardization. So identifying the universe of measure characterizations that exist in California, um, looking at each of them, identifying which of them are overlapping, and then consolidating them, and creating a more similar level of standardization and consistency. So uh, that process is currently underway, and um, we have, we've identified about 225 distinct measures. And a key um, responsibility of the CalTF is looking at the consolidated measures, um, identifying um, and flagging issues, and, and reviewing and approving them. The other uh, key component is a new software tool. And the intention of this tool would be that it would be a relational database. Um, it would be a comprehensive statewide repository of measures. Uh, it would include workflow management features so that when a new measure is developed or updated, um, it would be easy to see the progression of the measure to final approval at, at the commission. Um, and it would make it, it would, uh, a key piece of it is linking the documentation supporting the values um, to the values themselves, which again is, um, has been a, a very important need in California. And then finally, it would allow for commitments tracking. So when either commission staff or the CalTF identify additional data or EMV that could help refine measures, it would be easy to flag that and then make sure that the additional data is collected and used to update measures in the future. Uh, the, other, the other key piece of this is, as, that I mentioned is the engineering review of the consolidated, measure, consolidated measures to um, flag and um, update additional uh, measures with additional information that's become available since they were first characterized. In addition um, to the actual measures themselves, um, <clears throat> there are a number of process changes that the California Technical Forum has been discussing to try and make the process more open, transparent, inclusive. Um, and these are some of the changes that have been discussed in the California Technical Forum that I think all align with the recommendations in the TRM manual. Um, so number one, opening the process to other parties besides utilities and um, the CPUC, uh, ensuring that the review of the measures is collaborative from the beginning, <clears throat> having very clear written technical guidelines um, QAQC requirements and standardization requirements so that when you know, work paper developers are either developing new measures or updating measures, it's very, very clear what the requirements are and they can be successful as opposed to producing something and then being told, no, 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 that was bad, go back and redo it. Um, we, we think it's critically important to have early input from regulatory staff. Um, we also think because, you know, for reasons that I think Dr. Brightwell and Steve mentioned, Steve Schiller, um, that having CPUC staff review and approval is uh, critically important at the end, particularly when you have a situation of shareholder incentives where there is a financial incentive to um, inflate the values. And so it's important to have independent regulatory review at the end. Um, so in, in terms of um, updating the measures, uh, I think there was some discussion previously about the importance of regular updates. And the CalTF's recommendation is making sure that the update process is open to everybody, just like Dr. Brightwell described in Illinois, that there be a set time every year where anybody who's got visibility into the market or has opinions about things that should be updated can make the changes. And then there's an open, transparent process for considering which changes are most important and evidence-based um, and, and doing that in an open public way, but also including uh, input from a broad range of, of the stakeholders. Um, and then uh, we also think it's very important that the regulators approve the updated ETRM on an annual basis, but provide the, the approval um, long before the changes have to be implemented so that the utilities and the implementers are not whipsawed by sudden changes that then require that they have to change programs that then create market disruption. <clears throat> so the outcomes, uh, the desired outcomes of, of this project are to have a statewide and consistent set of values, approaches, and data. 
Uh, there was some discussion about a regional TRM, and in California there are essentially regional differences. So the POUs, the publicly owned utilities, and IOUs are under different regulatory regimes, and so that does lead to some variation in how measures uh, need to be characterized. But that can be fairly easily um, done through, through the ETRM relational database structure. Uh, second piece is um, the, the strong importance of having values well documented and transparent, uh, workflow management, so it's very easy to see what's in progress, um, you know, what new measures are being created, uh, what's being updated. And then back-end commitment tracking to ensure that when data collection requirements are identified either by regulators or the peer review process, uh, that the data collection is actually, that, that that happens and doesn't get forgotten about later. Uh, and then the, in, in terms of process outcomes, um, we're seeking again to create a process that's open to everybody, not limited to utilities and CPUC staff, um, a process that has very, very clear standards and requirements, that it's collaborative, and that it involves early and ongoing staff input, regulatory staff input. Uh, our, our plan has always been to complete the project by December 2018. We're still on track for that. Um, however, we um, would have to get the project approved by the CPUC um, based on prior CPUC decisions, and we're in discussions with the CPUC staff, and then we'll later be in discussions with the CPUC about what the right regulatory path to approval will be for this, for this project. Okay, thank you very, very much, Annette, uh, for uh, covering through all of that so quickly. Uh, I see and, we're running out of time. <laughs> so. No, <laughs> well, you did excellent. Uh, we, you know, uh, let me just pop over uh, again uh, to the uh, the last slide and just say that uh, the um, the uh, your you know the I'm sorry the each, the California Technical Forum does have a website and there is uh, information. Uh, excellent information up there uh, about the technical forum, which people can find uh, on the web for more information about that, um, and the, including uh, some on the ETRM. So, uh, with that, you know, we're reaching the end of our uh, presentations here. Hopefully, uh, this has been useful for our audience. I do want, in our remaining few minutes, to see if our other presenters have uh, any uh, last comments they'd like to perhaps leave our audience with uh, about how you know you would suggest key points, you know, one, two, or so, uh, how to make their TMs the most useful and effective. Um, and you know, not not misuse. So um, I know, Katie, we had you up first. Maybe put you on the spot. I don't know if you have any uh, last words of wisdom for folks. And then uh, David or Annette, if you want to add to that. Sure. I would basically say the collaborative process for us has worked well. Having the transparency that goes into creating that document, and then also, I think an annual update is key. Great, thank you. David, I don't know if you want to go up next, if you have the last uh, words of wisdom for our audience. I think I would almost say verbatim what Katie just echoed, especially the portions about the collaborative process to get inputs from the various parties that have expertise in various areas, and additionally to uh, reduce the amount of contention within the dockets that come about to determine the savings. And uh, Annette? Uh, I have a variation on the theme. So my, my top three are number one, the importance of documenting the values to, to ensure that they're credible. Um, number two is um, updating annually, but also really tracking data needs that are identified and following through with those. Um, too often they just get forgotten about. And generally, in my experience, the um, technical experts always want more information. They're never satisfied with what you present to them because it's, it's expensive to collect information. So it's, it's really helpful to have a follow-up data collection plan and try and do as much of the data collection uh, through program implementation as possible. Uh, and then the final, the final point is um, being conscious of managing conflicts, particularly if the, the, the utilities are in a model of, of getting shareholder incentives, because then there's really 
um, a lot of incentive to inflate values, and, and so that's a really, really important um, issue to consider in structuring the group um, to make sure the values are, are not too too optimistic. Well, great. Well, uh, I want to thank all three of you for uh, providing and, and sharing, you know, the experience and expertise you have in the subject with our audience. Uh, and, you know, the reminder uh, to our audience that I um, want to thank them for their participation as well and, and the good work that all of you are doing. For more information on the TRMs, uh, there is the TRM guide from C Action, as I've mentioned you know, probably too many times here, uh, as well as many other resources that are referenced within the TRM guide as well as at the C Action website. Some of these are listed here on this slide. Uh, this webinar uh, is recorded and the slides and the presentation, the verbal presentations will be uh, up on the uh, web shortly. And I want to thank all of you for participating. I'm sorry, some of you had some uh, questions that uh, came in uh, towards the end here that we weren't able to quite get to. Uh, if you're interested, um, welcome to uh, send them uh, to, um, to me uh, at srschiller at lbl.gov, and we'll see if we can get uh, further answers to your questions. And for that, again, thank you presenters, and thank you audience, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>